So I am Larry Calvers. I hold our chair, Chad Dreyer Chair in Accounting Ethics, so welcome tonight. Uh, I have a few things to say. First of all, if you need CPE, and if you don't know what that is, you don't. So uh, there is a sheet over here. Uh, I want to thank a few people. I want to thank my colleague and attorney in my FOIA lawsuit against the Department of Justice, Dan Jacobs, who uh, had the connection to find uh, tonight's speaker. I want to thank Natalie Dirdak for uh, her work on publicity and keeping reservations and so on. I want to thank Nancy Donovan for her organizing the event and to her students uh, who are helping her tonight. Uh, I want to thanks the, thank the Art Chad Dreyer Chair in Accounting Ethics itself for funding the event tonight and also uh, for the Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability, uh, which we are associated with now. I also want to recognize Chad and Jenny Dreyer's contribution in their time and treasure to the university over the years. Uh, sadly, Chad Dreyer passed away this December. Uh, some of you know him, many of you may not have, but he was a very proud graduate of LMU's accounting program and was very successful in his career, uh, which led to being CEO of uh, Ryland Group and also chairman of the board of trustees of LMU and he made some amazing uh, progress for LMU to make it what it was today. So I hope you'll keep Chad and his family in uh, your prayers. I wanna mention the CBA has a new mission statement that's coming out, and it's a very appropriate for tonight's speaker. So our new mission statement is one sentence. We advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community. So there will be a test on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like this group. They're clapping the rest of the year. Wake up. Come on. So now I can introduce our great speaker for tonight, Sampriti Gungali, is Chief Executive Officer of Arabella Advisors. Arabella Advisors was founded in 2005 and has evolved into a mission-driven certified B Corporation. She oversees all aspects of the firm's performance, including revenue, operations, strategic growth, marketing, client services. Uh, before joining Arabella, she was with the uh, Corporate Executive Board, now Gartner, for 14 years, where she was Executive Director of CEB's Legal Risk and Compliance Practice, Managing Director of CEB's Government Practice, and before that, eight years as Managing Director of the company's Finance Practice. Uh, I could go on and on about her. I just want to mention that she received a BA with distinction in economics and political science from Swarthmore College. She was awarded a full tuition Freeman Fellowship to the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, where she earned an MA with distinction in international affairs. She then received her MBA from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School. She's a mother of two, two boys, 13 and 15, is that right? That's right. Cool. And she speaks five languages. I'm not sure which she'll use tonight. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see. I'm hoping English. And she enjoys Latin dancing, Zumba, historical fiction, and Asian cooking. She lives in Arlington, Virginia with her husband, Eric, also an SAIS graduate. Please give a warm welcome to Sampriti Ganguly. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. It is such a pleasure uh, to be here, and I'm absolutely honored and delighted to be with you this evening. Um, I, I would like to extend my personal gratitude to the faculty, in particular Larry, Jeff, Dan, uh, Kathy, who spent uh, now who have spent close to 24 hours uh, with me, um, and also to just thank the administration for an opportunity um, in. Uh, sort of a school and a program around accounting to really talk about building a mission and purpose-driven organization. My goal for tonight essentially is threefold. Um, the title of my talk, as you can see, is Managing a Business at the Intersection of Profit and Purpose. And I'm just going to go ahead and give you sort of the big reveal right here, which is that not only is it possible to run a business profitably and be entirely focused on the issues of our time. In fact, it's actually an absolute imperative. 
Um, during our time together, I'm going to sort of do three things. The first is I'd like to convince you that, in fact, profit and purpose are mutually reinforcing outcomes that can be important cultural cornerstones of a business by sharing some examples of companies, including my own, uh, as we try to have purpose and profit at the center of what we do each day. Second, I want to share with you some of the broader trends uh, that I see which make managing a purpose-driven business today a must-have, as opposed to just a nice-to-have in, in years to come. And then third, I want to share my personal perspectives on why I think it's actually hard to run a purpose-driven company. Um, and along the way, I'd like to maybe share some of my personal and professional experiences, if you, you'll indulge me, particularly for those of you in the audience who are thinking about what a career actually looks like. Um, and so I hope you'll, you'll do that. I'll pause for the end, and I definitely want to encourage you to ask questions either along the way um, or perhaps at the end if you have them. Yeah? Okay. The Madonna mic didn't work. Sorry about that. So as you heard from Larry, um, I work at Arabella. We provide the world's most ambitious philanthropists and investors, and we work with them to achieve the greatest good with their resources. One-liner. Um, but at the end of the day, it's sort of like the greatest job in the world. We get paid to help people figure out how to give money away. And I, I remember pretty distinctively when I got a call from the executive recruiter for this particular position. And I hadn't heard about Arabella Advisors. I actually hadn't even heard about philanthropy or con philanthropy consulting. And I remember thinking, like, is this for real? Like, this is for real? This is an actual job? How hard can it be to give money away? Well, it turns out it's actually pretty hard. Um, it is actually hard to give away a lot of money for three reasons. The first is that the laws that surround sort of charitable giving are actually pretty complicated. They vary across all 50 states. They're complex from a reporting perspective. The second is it is notoriously hard to measure social impact and to do so consistently. And the third is that the burden of wealth is actually very exhausting, both emotionally and psychologically. And for all of those reasons, the firms like ours actually exist. Before I talk about sort of what we do, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context around philanthropy. So what you see here is a pie chart around charitable giving and the uh, places where it is allocated. Just as a little bit of context for those of you who don't follow this field very much, philanthropy um, here in the United States, the US is the most charitable uh, country as measured by giving. And in 2017, which is where we have the latest data, philanthropy comprised of about $410 billion. So that's a decent amount of money to, to give away to charity. Um, a third of that goes to religious institutions, uh, so your church, your synagogue, uh, your mosque. And another 14% actually goes to education. And let me be clear, when we say education, we actually mean institutions of higher learning, such as Loyola Marymount University and others. And a lot of that actually goes towards buildings. Um, so basically, once you carve out religious institutions and education, all of a sudden, you're left with sort of half of that pie, about $200 billion. And if you look at, let's say, human services, so things that you typically think about, social services, it's actually a pretty small little bucket of money, $50 billion or so. Um, so the story of philanthropy, in many ways, is the story of sort of David and Goliath. Philanthropists take on sort of the world's most complex social problems with not a whole lot of money to actually solve for that. And that's one of the reasons that philanthropy is known either as patient capital or catalytic capital or risk capital. Philanthropy tries to solve for problems and challenges that the private sector can't 
and or that the government sector can scale. That has historically and traditionally been what its role in society is, and that is where we try to sort of help our donors. Just a little qualifier for those of you who I know are, are pretty interested, this does not include impact investing per se, but it is a sort of a very traditional and narrow definition. Um, there's a sort of pretty open debate right now as to whether philanthropy can fill the gap for sort of lowered government services or um, other social challenges. And if you do the math, uh, $410 billion is about 2% of GDP. The government is about 25% of GDP. Financial services firms are about 20% of GDP. And so mathematically, there's really no way that sort of philanthropy can cover that gap. And that's just sort of important context to have in mind as you think about, if you will, the power, promise, and potential of social change. Uh, we've been in business for about 14 years. We've influenced, as we measure it, about $4 billion of philanthropic capital. Um, we have 200 staff uh, in four offices, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, uh, and DC. Um, these are some of our clients that you see on the left side of the page. We work with institutional donors like the Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation. We work with corporate foundations, and we work with a lot of individuals and family donors. Um, I can't really share their names with you. I'd have to kill you. But suffice it to say, we work with some names that you probably know and heard of. As we've tried to build this business, we have tried to be very intentional and purposeful about who we are and, and what we do. So among the more exciting things we get to do, um, we launched a good food practice a couple of years ago. And what we're really trying to do is spur investments into sustainable food systems and sustainable food technologies. So you may have heard of mushroom-based meat alternatives, but you may not have heard of tomato-based tuna alternatives which is a company that is trying to figure out how to solve the problem of uh, unsustainable fishing practices for tuna, which some of you may know is the apex predator. And when you deplete tuna, you deplete the entire ecosystem that thrives on having that apex predator. So we have a company we found and diligenced a company that's trying to find tuna, uh, alternatives to tuna and things that taste like tuna to supply to sort of the sushi markets of this world. We've also figured out and identified a company that is focused on a technology that's a bitter blocker. And what this technology does is it is injected into foods. Um, it blocks the taste of bitterness, which in turn reduces the need for sugar, which in turn leads to lower obesity in our society. And so I share this with you because these are just examples of companies and technologies that are really started and originated and incubated based off of social change with social change at their very core. And these are some of the ideas that we bring to our clients. On the non-investing side, on pure grant making, we are working on solutions with some of our clients that are at the intersection of housing and health. So for example, we identified uh, a grantee organization in Atlanta that wanted to build an affordable housing complex that was mixed use. It was designed in mind for kids that were aging out of foster care that had nowhere to go in the system and pairing them with seniors who are not yet ready to move into assisted living. And the thought process there was that if you co-locate these young individuals who are moving out of foster care and you co-locate them with grandparent-like individuals, the youth could help those who are elderly and similarly, those who are elderly would be inspired and motivated by the young people they were living with. And these are the kinds of ideas or solutions that purpose-driven companies and social enterprises and philanthropists think about as they think about some of the most complex issues of our time. And that's the job that I get to do on a daily basis in terms of clients that we actually help. I mentioned that we spend a lot of time on our culture. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on going through each of these. Um, graphics is not our strong suit, I have to confess. But we spend a lot of time with these words. And there are a couple of values that I really would like to sort of call out for you that I think are important. 
And maybe an ask for those of you who are students who are thinking about a job is, I would really encourage you as you're going to talk to a prospective employer, in addition to asking the good questions like, how much will I get paid and what is the job I will do, ask a company about its values and how they live their values and their culture and their organization. So there are a couple things that I wanted to call out that I feel pretty proud of that we try to do as an organization. The first is we really focus on an individual bringing their whole self and their authentic self to work. The second thing that we do is we have a real commitment to diversity, and that is diversity of viewpoints, and that's how we think about it. We know that diverse teams build and bring greater value into an organization. And the last is we commit to 30% of our time um, to learn and further the field. Also, because we work in the charitable sector, we have 20 hours uh, that we commit to volunteer work for all of our staff in addition to a national volunteer day. It's hard for us to tell our donors how to think about charity if we are also not um, committed to that. And these are very explicit decisions we make. We trade off greater billable hours. We great trade off productivity because we believe in those kinds of investments. So those are the things that we aspire to do. A couple of years ago, we asked our staff, how well are we doing on those metrics? And it turns out we weren't doing that well. So we had to really step back and say, what's missing? Um, and as we looked at it and diagnosed our data, what our, what our employees told us was we were not being as inclusive of a workplace as we needed to be. So we did a couple of different things. We created a program called ILAs. Those are called Inclusion Leaders at Arabella. These are individuals at every level of the organization across all of our offices and all of our teams. And it's a group of individuals that have gone through unconscious bias, microaggression, and micro inequity training. And their job, um, uh, they have been sort of asked to call out behaviors that they see as non-inclusive within our workplace, including telling me when I say something or I make a statement that is not particularly inclusive. We have heritage months every, uh, for every month that exists at Arabella. Uh, a couple of years ago, we used February, which is uh, African American History Month, and we watched an excerpt of the uh, Netflix documentary called 13th. Has anyone ever seen that? Um, it talks about the 13th Amendment and what that actually means. So we have really, really tough conversations um, in our organizations around inequity and what that actually means. And that may seem like it's pretty standard if you're in a college campus, but that's actually not very common behavior in a corporation. Those are not things that are typically permissioned in an organization, and yet they're pretty core to both who we are and, and what we do. And so we spend a tremendous amount of time trying to be very intentional about our culture. Um, and that really becomes a cornerstone that sort of drives um, a lot of our decision making. The last thing we do is we try to create a culture around transparency. And this is, um, I'll get to this in a moment, but this is really what is core to us being a B Corps. Can I do a quick show of hands? Who here knows what a B Corps is or has heard that term? Okay, just a few of you. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, but one of the core values of being a, a B Corps is transparency. Um, and so as a privately held firm, we actually share our financial and staff information with everyone at the company twice a year um, as our commitment to transparency. And according to our staff survey, 94% um, of our staff uh, appreciate the autonomy that they have in their day-to-day -day work. 92% feel a real connection to impact. And 96% have a tremendous amount of respect for these colleagues. These are phenomenal sort of benchmarks, something we're really proud of. That said, our turnover rates are no different um, than any other consulting firm. So even with that kind of intentionality in terms of what we do, we still aren't seeing uh, measurable change in sort of our retention metrics. And that's sort of the flip side of transparency. I, I love to show this data. I don't love sharing the fact that we don't have sort of much higher retention than, than we would like. Uh, part of it is the challenge of a professional services firm. Um, and part of it is we've still not got that right equation and, and that's something that we're trying to balance on, our, on a regular basis. So if that's sort of our firm and how we try to create mission and purpose, how does that fit with the broader context of, of what we're seeing? 
And I wanted to share some sort of broader societal data that I think is, is really important. I stated earlier that I think it's imperative for leaders to think about social mission today. I would argue that there's sort of five openings or opportunities that we have. I'll go through each of these in turn. The first is sort of uh, the yawning, I would say, gap in, in wealth inequality in our society. The second is, believe it or not, in spite of what you may think, um, trust in corporations is growing, and that pre presents a real window for us. Um, there's a different kind of shareholder engagement. Customers have different buying behaviors, and the workforce is actually changing. So let me sort of start with what I believe, as, as both a concerned citizen and a CEO, um, the greatest challenge that we face as a purpose-driven company is, is sort of the, the I would say the greatest societal challenge of our time, which is the widening wealth gap. So let me just sort of start with some facts. I'm sharing some data here from the Urban Institute, but many other fine academic institutions have corroborated these data. Um, and so the first sort of fact is average wealth has actually increased in the uh, past 50 years, but it hasn't grown equally for all groups. So if you just look at this data between 1963 and 2016, a few things sort of pop out. The first is that families near the bottom of the wealth distribution, so those at sort of the 10th percentile or the lowest decile, went from having no wealth on average to actually being in debt uh, on average of about $1,000. Those in the middle, that 50th percentile, have actually doubled their wealth. Families near the top, so the 90th percentile, saw their wealth increase fivefold. And wealth for those at the 99th percentile, so you'll often hear them term the 1%, um, those are the people that are wealthier than 99% of the income decile, their wealth grew sevenfold um, during that time period. And these changes have increased inequality significantly. Um, the 0.001%, many of whom are our clients, um, that's even more attenuated and, and more pronounced. So just to maybe put it a little bit in perspective, in 1963, families near the top um, essentially had six times the wealth of uh, those at the bottom. By 2016, that is 12 times the wealth. They doubled their wealth. And, and you'll notice that I'm using my words sort of carefully here. I'm using the term wealth and not income. Um, that's because income is money that comes into a family. Wealth is sort of the sum total of a family's assets, things like savings, real estate, equity, stock that they may have, financial security. Wealth cushions families against sort of changes in economic conditions in a way that income doesn't. Wealth also grows as the economy grows, um, and wealth disparities are actually much greater than income disparities when, when you look at it. So it's not a particularly pretty picture, and if you begin to look at this even deeper um, uh, by racial and ethnic background, the picture actually gets worse. So according to demographers, by 2024, we will become a majority minority nation. For those of you who live in Los Angeles, I'm sure it feels like we're already there. Um, and though families of color will make up the majority of the population, most continue to fall behind uh, whites in terms of building wealth. So white families, again, on average, have seven times more wealth than uh, black families and, and five times that compared to Hispanics. And in fact, the data show that we are worse off today in terms of racial inequality than we were in 1963. These are very real issues and broader indicators of progress sort of mask this inequality in wealth. And, and if you believe or know that with wealth and money come power, then I think there's a lot of work to be done. And the reason that I share this data is because this is core to the work that we do. Um, there's no irony that is sort of lost on me that it's precisely this inequality in wealth that gives rise to our business in the first place. The reason that we have a consulting firm that's focused on sort of uh, charity is because of this inequality in, in, in wealth. I think one of the foundational characteristics, if you carry this thread further, is there's a sort of belief that the American dream, this ideal that children have a higher standard of living than their parents, 
is, is getting lost. Um, for many of you, whether it's your families that have sacrificed so that you could come here to university or your great uh, grandparents or, or their grandparents coming here for better opportunities, I think many, for many, they feel like this is lost. And, and the data bear this out. In 1940, uh, the average son, if you will, would have a nine in 10 chance of earning more than his father. Today, that chance is five in 10. Um, and so we really do have a structural challenge around inequality in this society. So why does this sort of matter? Um, and, and why am I sort of spending so much time on it? Um, for us to do our work, we have to have a foundational understanding of this and be able to work with our clients to think about ways to address that. We have to have our staff that appreciate and understand this so that they can be very thoughtful about the interventions that make a difference. And I would say as CEOs, part of our job is to really think about job creation but we can't just think about job creation in the absence of thinking about income redistribution and having a point of view about what is fair in that equation. And that may sound like a controversial statement, but if you believe that there is something to be said around the American dream, I believe that it is actually important for us to do that. In addition to sort of this broader trend, I would argue we have an opportunity and so what I show on this page is data from the Edelman Trust Barometer. Over the past 20 or so years, Edelman has detected and documented some of the largest sort of public opinion shifts uh, shaping the world. And, and they've observed both that the, the state and the dynamic of trust in institutions is in many ways predictive of larger societal, economic, and political changes to, to come. So for all of the reasons I shared earlier, uh, there's a consensus belief that the, the system is broken. Uh, four in five people would agree with that statement. And despite what is a pretty high lack of faith in the system, interestingly enough, 56% of the general populations look to their employer to be a trustworthy source of information. Um, they expect their employers to have a point of view on contentious social issues. And unsurprisingly, if you look at the sort of green charts on the top, there's actually very low trust in government and the media. So to a certain extent, if you think about the role of institutions, there is the highest degree of trust in nonprofit organizations, that's the NGO bucket, and in corporations. So if you will, there is a window that we have. Um, it was fascinating when I was looking at the data, 71% of employees believe it's critically important for my CEO to respond to challenging times, and more than three quarters believe um, uh, of the general population say that they want CEOs to take the lead on change instead of waiting for that to be mandated by government. So what that means sort of for me and my peers is we need to get out ahead of policy issues that are important to our employees. For example, when we recruit, we actually do blind resume screens for key positions to eliminate unconscious bias for hiring managers. That means we redact gender, race, uh, religious and academic backgrounds so that we're just focused on the skills of an individual's. A couple of years ago, we noticed that our um, non-white staff were coming in at lower salaries than their white counterparts for the same position. And it's because we were asking a critical question, which is, how much did you make in your last job? And essentially setting the floor for um, salaries. We eliminated that and we basically said we couldn't ask um, that of hiring managers. This year, we're really focused on building more inclusive um, uh, family policies, so not just maternal um, uh, leave, but parental leave, uh, leave for adoptive parents, leave for individuals who are taking care of an elder, recognizing that the definition of family is much broader than what the government actually mandates. And so all of these are sort of decisions that we're making in the absence of necessarily policy or prescriptive guidance, but things that we believe are sort of the right thing to do as a company. One of the decisions that I had to make as a CEO when I joined the company four years ago was we had a changing demographic. Um, and before I came, we had covered 100% of the healthcare premiums for all of our employees. So our employees had free healthcare. 
But as our workforce grew and it, as it aged, that was simply not sustainable from a cost perspective. And so one of the harder decisions I had to make was to actually pass on that cost share to our employees. Um, that's never a popular uh, sort of decision uh, to take, but it was absolutely the right one. And that's an example of when you're trying to build a sustainable business, some hard trade-offs that you need to make. We didn't do it suddenly. We gave everyone 18 months um, to sort of absorb that. We allowed for sort of loan forgiveness for any individuals who couldn't afford it. But nonetheless, that was a structural decision that we actually had to make to sustain the business. So I think that there is far more opportunities um, to take advantage of this trust. Um, and to put it pretty crudely, this trust pays when employees trust their employers, they're more likely to stay, they're more likely to be advocates for an organization, and they're more likely to recommend you as an employer for others. So that really re reduces your recruiting costs. Um, I think one other thing that I'll um, say is, as I think about sort of CEOs being asked to speak up, um, the right after the uh, in 2017, there was an immigration ban that was directed at seven majority Muslim countries. And immediately after that ban went into effect, several of my employees who are Muslim or Muslim American came to me uh, concerned. They didn't feel safe anymore in the country that they called home. Uh, they were worried that they couldn't see uh, their family and their colleagues, and so I sent out a missive to all of our staff telling them that they were in a safe space. And I actually sent a note out to all of our 18,000 clients, essentially saying that they should think about directing their charitable dollars towards supporting uh, communities in need in this particular time. And uh, let me tell you, I got some real nasty notes back from some of our clients saying it was not our job to be political, um, that it wasn't really our role to tell them how they should sort of move their, their money. Um, and so that was a hard sort of moment when I thought there was sort of pretty clear values alignment in our broader community, and it turns out there wasn't. Um, it was nonetheless, from my perspective, the right decision. But when you act with what you think is sort of moral courage and fortitude, you have to be prepared for any negative feedback that kind of comes from that. I think for me, um, the idea of creating and building a society that is more inclusive feels deeply personal. Um, just as a little bit of background, I, um, I was born here in the United States when my dad was getting his PhD. And unlike a lot of immigrant families, we actually chose not to stay here. So we moved back to India, where I'm from, and I spent my formative years in the Philippines. Um, and I'll never forget my dad, he was very practical, and he kept my US passport, which I traveled with uh, all through my childhood. Um, and when I was young, he always said to me, with his inimitable Indian accent, Sampriti, America is the land of opportunity. You can be president someday, and that's why it's great. And um, I didn't really aspire to be president, but that left an impression. And the idea that somehow that opportunity was gonna be denied to others just didn't feel right. And so another sort of important leadership experience when you think about acting with moral courage is how do your sort of formed beliefs shape uh, what you do and how much are you willing to let those experiences kind of guide you? I think they are an important part of authentic leadership, but they are certainly not taught um, and so you've got to really figure out and spend some time reflecting on who you are, what you believe, and why you believe what you believe in order to be able to drive some of these harder business decisions. The third thing that I'll just sort of share with you, and some of you may have followed this, this is a very famous letter that's written by Larry Fink, who is the CEO of BlackRock. BlackRock is an institutional investor. They're the largest institutional investor, and they manage about $6 trillion um, in assets. And last year, Larry Frank wrote a letter. I have an excerpt of it. But he basically said, um, purpose, is not the sole, um, purpose is not the sole pursuit of profits, but the animating force in achieving them. And he essentially put a call out to corporations saying, you actually need to define what your purpose is 
in addition to what your profits are, created a pretty big stir across the entire investor community. But it has become an important cornerstone for corporations to go back and really redefine their purpose. I would contend that it is easier for a new company or a relatively new company like ours to have purpose at its core, much more so than it is for a global, multinational, highly distributed corporation that has been around for a long time. It's not to say that you can't, but the forces that work against you as a global multinational corporation, whether it's quarterly earnings pressures, whether it's a very disintermediated supply chain, whether it's being very far from your customers um, and or your sort of core suppliers, all of those make it harder to sort of create purpose. It can be done, but, but it is more challenging. Two other things that I just wanted to share with you uh, in terms of broader trends. I um, uh, wanted to just baseline, get some uh, sort of understanding of, of generations here. You can see those across the spectrum. Quick show of hands, anyone here know? Um, you want to raise your hand if you're a baby boomer? OK, we've got some in the room. Um, anyone here who self-identifies as Gen X? Not too many of us in the room. OK, uh, millennials? Surprisingly few and uh, Gen Z. It's the majority of this uh, majority of this room. So I'll um, I'll go to you guys um, for millennials. Sixty-seven percent say that the brand matters to their product quality. Only fifty-three percent of boomers actually care about that. Women, sixty-one percent say that they're more emotionally attached to their per uh, to a purchase. Only forty-five percent of men. And uh, uh, among other demographics, um, uh, those who are Hispanic, 70% will say brand value matters as much as product performance compared to 56% of the average population. So there is a changing preference among customers that present an occasion for purpose, not just as sort of the moral compass for an organization, but really sort of a marketing and, and brand opportunity. And for those of you in the room, and perhaps you can uh, sort of agree with me, I look at you as the future workforce. So if we're trying to build a company to attract new talent, 60% want to create impact in the world, 52% say honesty is actually the most important quality in leaders. At another time, I would substitute words like decisiveness, like other things. Honesty, not always. In fact, honesty hasn't always escalated to the top. But new generation of workers actually say that's important. So those are some of the, the trends that I think uh, create sort of an avenue to build an intentional purpose-driven company. So how do you do that, and, and how does that actually work? Well, one way to get there is through becoming a B Corps. Um, and, the, and the best way to think about B Corps is it's a certification process. So to the degree that you might have heard of USDA organic, LEED certified buildings, uh, fair trade uh, in terms of practices for coffee and coffee procurement, the Energy Star, which is a standard for uh, appliances and energy efficiency. That's what the B Corps certification is for companies. It's a standard certification process that we go through every three years where we essentially are documenting our business practices and being rated on what those actually are. So this is Arabella. Um, this is our B Impact report. We have a score of about 91.6. You need a 50 to pass, an 80 sort of average. Um, we're just a little bit above average as a company. And what does the certification actually do? Well, there's actually five different dimensions to it. Um, and you can see it on this page. There's governance. So it's things like how are decisions made in the organization? Um, what does the ownership structure of a company actually look like? Um, how tightly controlled is it? The second aspect is workers. How do we treat our workers? What kind of professional development do we give to our employees? What are our benefits program? How inclusive are they? Do we provide on the job and off the job uh, kind of training? The third is we look at our impact on our community um, uh, as measured by charitable giving as well as volunteerism. The fourth is we look at our environmental footprint, the carbon footprint that we create, um, recycling um, programs that we have, uh, proximity to public transportation, uh, among other things. 
Um, and then lastly, we are looking at our customers. What kind of uh, transparency do we actually create? So you can see our sort of scores on this particular assessment. We don't do very well on environment in large part because we're a services company. We're not an actual product company. We don't create things, so we don't really have an opportunity to impact our, our supply chain. We do really well with our customers because our customers are creating social change. And so those are some uh, kind of areas. Um, and this is something that becomes, uh, for us, a management tool that we use to guide a lot of our investment decisions. Um, there are today about 2,700 certified B Corps, so there's actually a lot of them. I think when I started looking at B Corps four years ago, there were 800. So just to give you a sense of how much that has grown, they're across 60 countries, 150 different industries. Um, to be fair, it is a, a, a standard that is evolving. It's very hard to come in with laser-like precision across this many different dimensions of types of companies, but it is an important guidepost for us. Um, and it drives a, a, a lot of our decision making, including our commitment to transparency um, and how we think about our communications. Um, other examples um, or other reasons that we have B Corps A, it's been a pretty successful recruiting tool for us. So. Uh, uh, employees that might otherwise go work in a big corporation say that they feel like they want to commit to being a, a B Corps. It's been important for our clients to know that we're sort of values aligned with them. Um, it's been helpful from a benchmarking perspective, so it gives us some very good practices that, that we can actually think about. Um, so on balance, it's been um, really interesting. The, the other thing that I'll say about being a B Corps is you think a lot about your capital and how your capital is deployed. Um, one of the areas that we looked at, and I, I shared this with you all, is we look at impact investing and we try to help organizations and companies think about divestment. Is anybody familiar with that, that term, divestment? Yeah. So um, Arabella recently did a report on uh, divestment, and you can see here today uh, there are about a thousand organizations that have committed to divestment. Uh, that's the data on the left at about six trillion dollars in commitments, um, and on the right you can see the sort of volume of those growing. For those of you who follow this closely, the Catholic community and faith-based institutions have been really a clarion call to the moral imperative to divest from fossil fuels. They've also been very intentional in creating a coalition around divestment. Um, and they've been real activists when it comes to the fiduciary responsibility for very large fossil fuel companies to talk about what they're doing in, in the area of divestment. That's one way that companies, um, B Corps and others, can think about their commitment to climate change. Um, another B Corps that I think takes this a little bit further is Patagonia. Um, some of you may know Patagonia. They make sort of fleece down jackets, things that you guys here in Los Angeles probably don't need to worry about. Those of, here, uh, those of us who live in the East Coast, when it's 10 degrees, really value their products um, uh, deeply. Uh, Patagonia is a B Corps. And I would say they have taken their commitment to climate change sort of above and beyond what I've seen a lot of different corporations do. And they really are very focused on what I would call holistic values alignment. So the first thing is they sort of make very clear that climate change is man-made and that they have a role to play in that. At the three o'clock, they quantify the business practices that they have implemented or will implement to reduce their carbon footprint by 2025. They um, have since, I think, 1985 provided $100 million in grants to environmental organizations, grassroots environmental organizations that are at the front lines of mitigating climate change. Um, they call it the 1% for their planet. And they are, if nothing else, um, huge activists in the area of climate change, whether it was the Dakota Access Pipeline, Utah, Bear Paw, you know exactly where Patagonia stands on an issue. It doesn't work for everyone, um, and it may not be sort of the, the right position, but it is a company that has been very, very clear about what their values are from the beginning, and they integrate their business practices, their giving, and their activism around that. Um, just uh, since we talked about sort of managing profit and purpose, it's a very profitable company. 
Uh, their revenues are about $750 million, so it's a large organization. However, if you were to compare Patagonia with REI, uh, which is also a competitor, REI is about $2.4 billion. So one of the things to sort of keep in mind about B Corps, it's all relative, but B Corps on balance are small. And the reason that they're small is they are very intentional about growth um, and they don't rapidly sort of scale their business. They test, they learn, they reinvest. Um, so if you're looking for a growth company, you may not always get it through a B Corps. And if you're looking for a business that works over the long haul, looking at a B Corps is kind of one, one way to go. Their mission statement is we're in business to save our home planet. It's a pretty strong, powerful statement. Another area of divestment that we've been focused on as an organization, and we wrote a report on this recently, is around the prison industrial complex. Um, so this may not be a surprise to some of you, but mass incarceration is a huge challenge in our society. Um, the United States uh, uh, has a prison population of over 2 million, and 3% of our total population is in, under some form of correctional supervision. So there's been a huge movement to divest from the prison industrial complex. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, you saw JP Morgan um, chase essentially uh, making a commitment to stop funding private prisons. They're one of the bankers, along with Wells Fargo and US Bank, that has funded the building of private prisons. For JP Morgan, this was a pretty easy decision to make. It was a very small part of their business. But the child separation incident being linked to prisons was sort of a moment for activists to get them to, to act. Um, there's another B Corps that I really admire that takes this concept of the prison population to um, another level, um, Greystone Bakery. Anybody here heard of Greystone? They're a small bakery uh, headquartered out of Yonkers, New York. Um, and they make these lovely brownies that you see on the left side of the page. They've had a very intentional relationship with Ben and & Jerry's, um, and it is their chocolate fudge brownie that animates uh, Ben & Jerry's chocolate fudge brownie ice cream. They've had a longstanding relationship with them. And what's interesting about Grayston is that they hire the unemployable. That is to say, they hire people specifically who are uh, coming out of prison, uh, who are disabled. And they have a pretty interesting process called the open hiring process, which basically means if you walk into their building and you fill out an application, you will be hired. They ask no questions about your background. And 60% of their um, bakers are ex-convicts, or as we like to use a more inclusive term, returning citizens. Um, and they make a very explicit commitment to hiring returning citizens. And the reason they do that is Yonkers, New York, um, has actually a much higher unemployment rate than the rest of New York. Um, they believe and have calculated that by hiring people through this open hiring process, they save $4,000 per person on recruiting. They have a 12% turnover rate in an industry that typically has 50 to 60% turnover. And they have re-injected sort of $15 million into their local economy because with people they've hired, those people are in turn sort of contributing to their society. And they are on a mission to make open hiring sort of a common practice across organizations. And it makes pretty good business sense. Um, if you think about where we are as a society, we are close to full employment. Um, and there's a sort of real shortage of talent. This seems pretty controversial, especially in a professional services context, in financial services, when you run all kinds of background checks, typically, on people and their criminal background. But it has been incredibly powerful to see a company that has embraced this as a policy and shown both the social and economic returns. Greystone is about $10 million in revenue, and their profits have doubled over the last four years. So another exemplar organization. This is Greystone's mission statement. Um, one of the things that I, I love is a mission statement in a corporation that talks about loving action. Our acceptance of others where they are, followed by right action, will lead to growth and positive change in the evolution of individuals, programs, and communities. Not sort of corporate language or corporate speak, 
Um, their founder was, um, I think, a rocket scientist and became a monk. So it may give a little bit of a sort of story as to why they got there. But be that as it may, it's a smart business strategy that has great social outcomes. Collectively, these 2,700 companies, of which we are a part, um, really lead with sort of business as a force of good at our, at our very core. We are part of increasingly what we call the B economy. We hire one another. Um, we go out of our way to hire other B cores. Um, we, uh, we have clients that are B cores. We have vendors that are B cores. So it's a, a little bit of a closed loop economy in terms of us trying to lift one another up. And we are certainly trying to make our standards sort of more commonplace and more part of the average business parlance. If you all get a chance, definitely look at some of those metrics um, and try to compare them side by side by some of the other business that you're, businesses that you're looking at. I think you'll find some real value in asking the core question of if you could run a business differently from scratch, how would you? Um, and and why would you? So that's sort of what I'll I'll say. Let me let me just maybe close. I spent a lot of time in an accounting uh, 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 sort of lecture talking about mission, purpose, and value. As I was sort of preparing for this lecture, um, I wanted to take time to actually look at your mission statement at LMU. <laughs> Um, and there were two things that really stood out to me. Um, the encouragement of learning, the education of the whole person, the service of faith, and the promotion of justice. Um, for those of you who are maybe joining the workforce in about three months, or maybe a year, or, or two years from now, I hope as you think about what your career is, whether it's the job that you take when you leave Loyola Marymount, or whether it's the job that you take 10 years from now, or 15 years from now, I hope you'll come back to the whole person and the promotion of justice in particular as a core value and bring it with you into your workplace. At LMU, you've built a phenomenal foundation. And the charge and the opportunity that you have is to sort of take that with you into the workplace so that collectively, we can build a better workplace together. So thank you very much for your time. It was a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Sambrini. So we have time for a few questions, and then I would like to invite you after that to come outside for some beverages and some food. And Sambrini will be out there to talk with you. Anybody have any questions that uh, they would like to ask? One at a time. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, was why is so much of this money going to institutions of higher learning, places that have endowments, as opposed to going into maybe lower income communities or places where there's sort of greater need? Um, I shared this a little bit earlier. Um, interestingly enough, the education space from a philanthropy perspective is actually complicated. And, and part of it is K through 12 education um, is really driven very deeply by some entrenched um, interests. One is sort of the public school system and the school board. The second are sort of teachers unions. And so without understanding the policy sort of environment, philanthropic capital actually does not have that strong of an impact. Um, and we've seen organizations like the Gates Foundation and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative actually go into 
into communities and um, not make uh, sort of uh, not not be very well received in certain communities, particularly as they have espoused charter schools as an alternative to the public school system. So that's one of the reasons why I think donors are a little bit more um, sort of reticent to do that. However, one of the bright lights that I would point to is a lot of the evidence suggests that. Um, interventions in early learning, so zero to five, basically have a huge impact on educational outcomes. And we are seeing a tremendous amount of money go into early learning programs here in California, in particular thinking about dual language learning as we become a society where our demographic is changing. A lot of donors are thinking about how do we get Spanish speaking teachers and build an infrastructure in the zero to five age where we could actually see that change. Change. So the good news is there is some work certainly to be done, but there are some uh, sort of behavior changes that we will need to see as well. That was a great question. Yeah. Uh, let's take one more question before we enjoy some beverages and some discussion. Anybody? Or we could just go enjoy some beverages and discussion. <laughs> uh, so before we do that, I just want to uh, thank you again. Thank you. So, And we, ha we have a bag full of oh, swag, swag, including I love swag. LMU. Oh, thank you. And a few other things. Oh, Great thank that, you. That may help you keep warm on uh, <laughs> the, right. the, on the East Coast. On the way back to the East Coast. So again, thanks so much for thank coming. Thank you. My and, pleasure. Uh, we'll see you outside. Yeah.